Hey, loser. Remember in the Jackbox 1 review when you said Cookie Matterson instead of Cookie Masterson? What was that about? I, uh, I goofed. How did you goof up that bad? I... I don't know. Well, maybe if you wait a literal month between that video and your Jackbox 2 review, people will forget. Hmm. A little less than a year after the first Jackbox Party Pack, Jackbox Games released its sequel, Party Pack 2, basically securing the Jackbox Party Packs as an annual series from that point forward. Even before discussing a single game, multiple quality of life improvements have been made all throughout this second Party Pack. A really big one, and I can't believe I forgot to mention this in my Party Pack 1 review, is now only the first player to join the game may start said game. And thank god for that one. When I was streaming Lyswater in Jackbox 1, I had like 20 plus people joining the games, and certain individuals kept trying to preemptively start the game before everybody got in, which, as you can probably imagine, is hard to keep under control when you're dealing with a large pool of viewers. Another big change was that this was the first party pack of an audience feature, a really great feature that makes these games great to play on streams or in large groups of your buddies. The way the audience feature works is that it lets whoever join in the game after the player cap has already been exceeded, or even while a game is still in progress. As an audience member, you can have affect the game in various ways. In a game like Quiplash, for example, you get to vote on your favorite answers just like all the other players can. In fact, in Quiplash specifically, as an audience member, your votes have just as much power as the in-game players. The audience cap for these games are usually pretty crazy too. For most games, it is 10,000 participants. That is cool and all, but are the games in Party Pack 2 good enough to justify a crazy participant cap like that? Well, Let's find out. The first game in the pack is Fibbage 2, and is the first proper sequel to a Jackbox game. Of all the sequels you've seen in the party packs, the jump from party packs Fibbage XL to Fibbage 2 is likely the smallest in terms of changes. I mean, even visually. If I run footage of these games right next to one another, you can see that very little has changed. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. Because of all the party pack 1 games, I would argue that it was Fibbage XL that was the most fundamentally solid. It already looked good, it already had good sound design, it was already paced well, and most importantly, it was already fun. So transitioning to Fibbage 2, it really is the same Fibbage gameplay you likely know and love. For those who don't, Fibbage will ask everybody a trivia question. Players will then type in what they believe could be a plausible answer, and then everybody's guess, alongside the real answer, will be tossed up on your screen. You get points for choosing the real answer, and extra points based on how many players you fool if you lie. The biggest difference is the addition of the defibrillator. You get to use it once per game, and when use, it will eliminate all but one fake answer and the truth, essentially giving you a 50-50 shot at finding the real answer. Personally, I think it's a cool feature. Only being able to use it once adds a bit of strategy to your standard game of Fibbage. Do you use it when you're pretty sure it's a certain answer but you want to reaffirm that assumption? Or do you use it when you have absolutely no idea what the answer could be, giving yourself a true 50-50 guess? Really, a smaller addition like the defibrillator was all that was really needed to round out the Fibbage experience without overdoing it. The only the only other thing they needed at this point, and thankfully was added in Fibbage 3, was better audience support. In this sequel, the only thing the audience members can do is vote for their favorite lie. This does not provide points, mind you. It only contributes to a thumbs up trophy at the end of each game, which is fundamentally nothing more than a silly little gag. Just an award given to the player of the most liked lies, regardless of said player actually won or not. But hey, a marginal improvement on Fibbage XL or not. Fibbage 2 proves that it has such a solid foundation that very little needed to be added to preserve the appeal of the game. Earwax. Oh boy, here we go. Quite often, I will see people say Quiplash is just Cards Against Humanity, and I think that's doing Quiplash a great disservice because between the three round structure, writing in your own prompts, having everyone vote on them, and of course the last round, where all the players submit something. I mean, yeah. I'd say Quiplash deviates from Cards Against Humanity enough to say that's not an apt comparison. The reason I bring all this up is because Earwax is quite literally just Cards Against Humanity with sound effects. The entire point of Earwax is to to make the best sound response to whatever prompt is presented to you. Much like Cards Against Humanity, there is a selected judge for each round. The judge of said round will pick a prompt for all the other players to use. Once the prompt is chosen, everyone playing, excluding the judge, has to pick the two best sound effects that either appropriately fit the prompt or are just the funniest. After players' responses have been submitted, the judge gets to decide on which pair of sound effects they like the most. If the judge picks your sound effects, you get a point, and the game keeps going until somebody reaches three points, which player reach 3 points will win the game. 
Being that Earwax is so fundamentally similar to cards, it shares one of my biggest problems of that game. The problem in question is that the game is only as funny as the hand you were dealt. It's frustrating when you get a prompt, can think of a way better answer on your own cognition, but you're limited to a set number of responses that all differ in quality. It always surprises me to just see the amount of people who will defend Earwax over other games because I don't think the concept is particularly strong to begin with, and even if it was, Earwax is a flawed game for several reasons. Firstly, all of the responses are played back to back. If you are playing an 8 player game, you'll hear so many entries, odds are you'll forget what the first couple of players responses sounded like. Obviously you can't read how something sounded, so to remind yourself of how something played out, all you can really do is listen to it again. I have played games where certain individuals will end up listening to half the player's prompts multiple times to remind themselves how they all sounded. I seriously can't blame them either, they're just trying to weigh out their options and be fair. Naturally though, though this can make the game feel like it's dragging. It is honestly the equivalent of playing cards against humanity, but once you read an answer, you have to flip that card over, basically forcing you to keep a memory of which card you initially thought was the funniest. But then after reading all the cards, you still took even more time to flip two or three cards back over to confirm with yourself. Okay, among them all, this one is the funniest. If this game worked like Quiplash where only pinned two players against the same prompt, this problem would have been alleviated. The second problem is that some players will straight up get better sounds than the others. Every participant gets a different collection of sounds. And just due to the nature of the game, certain sounds are just flat out funnier. Losing to your opponent because they got a better fart sound not only shows how juvenile the game can be, but how one-sided most rounds will play out. 3. You cannot hear the sounds at all when selecting what you want. All you get is a vague description that more often than not will not sound how you intended, which is a huge problem. And finally, the comedy isn't as new nuance as say something like quiplash. Sound effects like motor revving are so limited in how you can apply them. Ultimately, Earwax is a single barebones concept that is not expanded on in any meaningful way like Quiplash's three round format. Also, I gotta say, for a game all about sound, the accompanying music is kind of obnoxious. <laughs> The most disappointing aspect is when I hear people defend Earwax. I do understand them to a certain extent. I would be 100% lying if I said Earwax never made me laugh, because it totally has. Canadian argument. <laughs> That's an American idea. <laughs> I honestly think this idea could work if they made a few changes, beyond letting players hear their sounds. Because honestly, you should be able to hear exactly what you're submitting before it's up on the screen. I think the biggest way you can improve this game is to let the players search through the catalog of sound effects to get the exact response they wanted. Because then it would be more about who most cleverly stringed the responses together, opposed to who was lucky enough to get the funniest sounds. You could still have a set of six sounds or so as suggestions, but being able to search the exact sounds you wanted would completely transform Earwax into a more flexible experience. And for all the people who are about to say, everyone would just have the same responses then. Yeah, that. My counter argument is how often do you see two players type in the same response in Quiplash? Very rarely. In fact, I don't even have footage of that happening. You will sometimes see similar answers. But even in that scenario, the person who executed the idea better will still win. I mean, in Earwax, even with the system they have now, many of the responses still end up similar regardless. There are enough variants of farts, burps, firearms, whatevers. I have heard in Earwax for everybody's responses to be at least slightly different, even if they share a similar concept. Hell, they could even play around with letting the players audibly enact their response to the prompt. Honestly, I think there's a lot of ways to expand this game, so when people say they enjoy it, again, I do sort of get it. But in its current form, Earwax has too many faults that get in the way for this to be anything more than just a collection of funny sound effects. Bidiots. This one is deceptively complex. It took me about three full rounds to fully understand it. I'll do my best to try to explain exactly how this one works, but please bear with me. The premise is that you and up to five other players are all attending an art auction. Yeah, six player cap and no audience feature by the way. Everybody starts by drawing two pieces of art that matches the prompts they're given. The catch is that everybody will receive prompts that when drawn will likely end up looking like other prompts. So if you got the prompt traffic, someone else 
else might have got the prompt funeral procession, and then another person could have got the prompt road trip. When dealing with quick doodles, these are three simple prompts that could easily be mistaken for one another. This is intentional, because once the art is submitted, everyone's drawings will be randomly assigned different monetary values, and the game wants you to be unsure of the painting's actual value, solely due to the fact they're all going to look so similar. So you buy the drawing submitted by other players. The player who drew the piece being sold will get 50% commission on the final bid, and as the buyer, you want to buy what you believe to be the most expensive paintings for as cheap as possible, because at the end of the game, anything you bought will be sold for its assigned value, and the person with the most money at the end will win. But here's the thing, since a lot of the art looks so thematically similar, you might, for example, know that the drawing Fox is worth thousands. But then when you buy a piece you thought was Fox, you see that it wasn't worth jack sh** because what you actually bought was Coyote, and the person who had to draw Coyote just wasn't that good of an artist. The paintings are bought auction style, so you make a bid on how much you want to pay for something, and if someone else wants it too, they have to bid more than you. Offers keep rising until no one else wants to bid higher, at which point, the painting will be sold to the player who offered the most for the current drawing. So how do you know what painting is worth what? On your phone, you will be told the exact value of three drawings. Only in name though, using the example from before, if your phone tells you that Fox is worth 3400 that information is only going to help you so much when you can still mistake it for a doodle that just looked like Fox. Since you are only given the values to three drawings, evidently, every player will know the values to a different set of pictures. Using this information to your advantage is a part of the game. You might know that the painting Coyote is worth basically nothing, so you can capitalize on that by continually making crazy high bids on that worthless doodle, which can potentially trick other players into thinking it's worth a lot, all predicated on you faking an interest. You will also receive text on your phone that will let you in on what other players know or have. You might get a text message that says something like, this player knows the real values of the drawing on the screen, watch how they bid. Little clues like that can help prevent situations like before, where you might otherwise let someone trick you into thinking the trash on the screen is worth a fortune. Those are the basics, but they threw in two more things to keep an eye on. The first is the predatory loans. Let's say you blew all your money on a painting and you have nothing left to bid with. If that happens, you can take out a loan of 1000 between rounds, with the drawback of owing 1500 at the end of the game. Then there's a screw feature. You get one screw per game, and with it, you can force another player to make a bid on whatever drawing is currently on the screen. So if you know something isn't worth jack, you can make the person in the lead blow all their money on something they didn't even want. The only thing that can get you out of a screw is another player making a higher bid after the fact. And, uh, I think that's the gist of it. You get all that? There's a lot to keep track of in Bidiots, and like I said, I didn't even get the game myself until I played it a couple of times. It's a really unique concept. A fairly strategic one at that. Honestly, whenever I think about how everything here is designed, it makes me second guess my opinion on this one. This just feels like something I should like. But it's never as fun as I think it's going to be, and I do think a large part of that is that Bidiots drags. I imagine they limit the game to 6 players due to how long the bidding process can take, but realistically, that is something that should have been addressed anyway. The host can do the whole $1100, $1100, elegant, divine, this is a great piece of art and it can be yours for only $1100, do I see it? Look, you get the point. He can go on and on and then once he starts doing the whole going once, going twice, at which point someone else can drop another bid, starting the whole cycle over again, which happened to me in fact in the footage you're watching right now. The auction for this drawing was already going on for quite some time. Then Graham, thanks for helping out by the way, youtube.com slash two left thumbs, makes a bid for 1800. Then the host goes on and on for a literal 40 seconds. I kid you not. Then once he starts doing the whole going once, going twice thing, fish fins over here, blah 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 makes a last second bid, and then we have to wait through everything all over again. This game just goes on and on, and look, I get it, it's supposed to emulate an auction, which is cool and all, but I'd also like it if they could emulate a well-paced party game. If during the current art piece, if it ever gets to the point where the host says, going once, going twice, the guy should not be able to do his whole auctioneer spiel until the next drawing, because if it gets to the countdown during the round, it's probably clear to everyone playing what the giant number on the screen says. And if you waited that long, you probably have a good idea of what you're willing to pay. It's just a matter of baiting people into how much they will pay. There are some Jackbox games that don't work well as an objective game, but are so funny, they are still fun games. 
TKO is a perfect example of a funny but dysfunctional game, which I'll expand on more in my Jackbox 3 review. But the point is, that's okay, as long as it succeeds in one or the other. Even though the player who makes the best drawings or slogans likely won't win TKO because they can't use their own stuff. I like TKO because it's funny. Bidiots, on the other hand, is not that funny of a game. At the very least, it is the least humorous drawing game. That being the case, Bidiots needs to fall back hard on its design elements. And it mostly does. At its core, Bidiots is easily one of the most strategic games in any party pack, or at least it is on paper. Graham from Two Left Thumbs loves this game, yet despite being way more experienced than me, he ended up losing. And here's the deal, I don't even think it was necessarily because he was bad, because I don't think he did anything inherently foolish. On the contrary, I ended up winning that game, and I hardly knew what I was doing. I really do think it comes down to the limited information each player has. When you couple the similar drawings with the fact you were only given three names. It really undermines all the strategy this game should have. Honestly, it should tell you the names of five or six drawings opposed to three. Having the name and price of a painting doesn't guarantee anything, when you could easily be mistaking it for a drawing that just had a similar prompt. Therefore, even in a scenario where all the names and values are given to you, there would still be both strategy and luck at play. Luck because even of all 12 names and values, not to sound like a broken record, you can never be 100% certain which prompt correlated with what doodle, and there would still be strategy because of the screws, loans, and generally how you handle your money. I don't see any beneficial reason to give each player only 3 names and values if guesswork would still be present even with all 12. I obviously don't think you should be told all 12, but to prove you can still make mistakes even if you had all of them. For instance, check this out. In a game I played, we had the prompts rich, stacks of cold hard cash, all the money I have, cash money, paper money and piles of papers. All of those have the potential of being stupidly similar. In fact, here was a drawing for paper money and here was a drawing for cash money. Even if you had the values to both of these, there's no way to know for sure which is which. Or what about the prompt all the money I have? Somebody could have just drawn a single bill for that one and things would have been even more confusing. Speaking of which, it might be too easy to cheese the system on this one. This might be the only drawing game where you don't want to be a good artist. If something you drew is worth a lot, you obviously would want people to know exactly what your prompt was, cause you know, you get that 50% commission and all. But this is a 50-50 we're talking about. It's just as likely something you drew was worth squat. However, the more vague your drawing is, the more things it could be mistaken for, which will result in a higher probability of people betting high on your art because they think it's something else, resulting in you receiving a higher commission. In a 6 player game, I've noticed there will generally be five paintings or so that will all share a similar prompt, half of which will have a high value. So if something you drew can be mistaken for more than one high value prompt, that is a very good thing. Deconstructing the game like this makes me wonder if Bidiots should even be considered a drawing game at all. I mean sloppy art is rewarded, and you don't need to draw anything at all, since they will always submit something for you if you come up blank. That being said, the game is centered around the things you draw, so I guess that technically makes it a drawing game. In Bidiots defense, the fact I'm even questioning how it should be labeled is proof that this is, at the very least, a really unique party pack game. There is nothing quite like it. So again, credit where credit is due. I know I spent a long time talking about Bidiots, but the reason for that is that this is the only Jackbox game where I can never give a definitive response on how I feel about the game. You could straight up ask me what I think about any other party pack game, and I could give you a quick response without even thinking about it. Bidiots isn't like that though. It has so many great ideas, all of which are met by an equal setback. Even still, there really is nothing else like it. Bidiots has something of a cult following these days. It ain't as popular as Drawful, but the people who do like it really like it. If what I just described sounds intriguing to you, odds are you might like it too. A flawed game, but an inspired one. I wouldn't say this makes or breaks Party Pack 2, but I am glad it exists on ambition alone. I have been harshly critiquing for a while now, so let's brighten things up with Quiplash XL. Quiplash was originally a standalone title you could buy for 10 bucks. It was released between Party Packs 1 and 2 for the PS3, PS4, Xbox One, and PC. Similar to Fibbage XL from Jackbox 1. It was brought back for a future party pack, this one, acquiring that XL for being the same exact game released months prior with some extra prompts. If you know anything about Jackbox party packs, odds are you know what Quiplash is. It's easily their most popular and well-revered game, even overshadowing their staple series You Don't Know Jack. So in Quiplash,
Flash, you will receive two prompts on your phone. Stuff like... The worst thing to try to sell door to door. On your device, you enter a funny response to that prompt. Then your response will be pit up against the other player who also received that prompt. Together, players and audience members vote for their favorite between the two responses. Up to 10,000 audience members, by the way. Unlike Fibbage 2, the audience actually has an effect on the game. They can vote for their favorite answers as well, and their votes count towards the final vote tally. The game is split up into three rounds. The third round, seeing all the players respond to the same prompt. You then have three votes of your own to allocate to whichever responses you thought were the funniest. It even lets you use more than one of your votes on a single response if you thought something in particular was really funny. It all culminates to a final score, and whoever has the most points after all three rounds is crowned the victor. I mentioned this earlier, but if you look at any initial reveal for Quiplash, just about everyone and their grandma compared the game to Cards Against Humanity. Saying Quiplash is a Cards Against Humanity clone is selling this game short on all that it does. In my opinion, Quiplash Flash is way better than Cards Against Humanity, since in that game, it is less about you yourself being funny, and more about being lucky enough to have that one funny card perfect for the current prompt. Whereas in Quiplash, you actually have to be funny yourself, since there are no cards to use in place of your own humor. Since you can type in whatever you want, how funny your response was is entirely on you. Quiplash is great because not only is it a super simple and fun party game, but objectively, everything about this game is balanced and fair. For instance, you might get a prompt that is more restrictive than prompts other players got. However, since there is always one other person to receive the same prompt you got, it's still a test of whoever made the funniest response, lame prompt or not. Hiding the names of whoever wrote the responses until all the votes are in was also a really smart choice. There is no bias, no way to know which answer was written by the winning player, just two answers, vote for the funniest. Quiplash is the most popular Jackbox game for a reason. It appeals to such a large demographic and people just immediately get it. The only critique I have for Quiplash XL, and it's a small one, is the music. That might be a minor thing, but I think people overlook how well music can set a tone, not just in the game, but outside as well. I mean, when you're playing a party game, you don't want to hear slow droning music that can potentially kill the mood of the party. Especially for something like Quiplash, you want something energetic, something with a bit of mischievous energy. I mean, here's the round one right music from this Quiplash. And then here's the round one right music from Quiplash 2. For that to be my only nitpick with Quiplash XL though, I mean yeah, that says a lot about how solid it is. Quiplash XL isn't just one of the best Party Pack 2 games, it's one of the best Party Pack games, period. Last but not least, we have Bombcorp. This and Zeeple Dome from Party Pack 5 continue to hold the distinction of being the only two Party Pack games, where the sole purpose is for all the players to work together. However, unlike Zeeple Dome, Bombcorp has a gameplay loop that benefits from its external device format. The premise is that you and your buds, up to four by the way, which I'll comment on later, are new hires at a corporation that specializes in defusing bombs. The contrast between the office job environment and the absolute severity of your job is hilarious. For each bomb, there are four sets of instructions that get split up between all the players. So if you got a full game of four people, everyone gets one rule. If you got two people, they receive two rules, etc. The rules can range from something as simple as cut wire four, to something as complicated as it telling you to cut the wire wires in order of the rainbow starting of red. You need to pay very close attention to the rules because they can often contradict each other. If someone has a rule that tells you to cut all even wires, but someone else has a rule that says not to cut wires that are green, then you can only cut even wires that are not green. There is a lot of content here. Frankly, I'm impressed. They divvy up the gameplay loop with other tasks like filing papers or making coffee, all of which will blow up if you mess up. Truthfully, there was so much to experience in this game I wasn't even able to get through all the levels to see it all. I mean, this stuff is hard. I must have spent a literal four hours or so trying to beat day eight with some buds. That day ends with you filing folders by name, and on three player, it will give each person four names, right? So not only will it ask you to file from Z to A, which is already confusing, but if it asks you to file by last name, it will give you five last names that all start with the same letter, three of which will just straight up have the same last name. So then you're categorizing by first name, which they will make very similar. Someone might have the name Teddy with a Y, and someone else might have the name Teddy with an I. 
Did I mention there's a time limit on the day we were stuck on? It gives you 90 seconds to file 12 names, which might not sound too bad, but since we only had four names each and had to file it backwards since it's Z to A, having to communicate with the other players exactly what you have, that's not easy. A little too hard in fact, considering it makes the bombs themselves feel like a joke. You can play this one by yourself, and it is much easier if you do so, albeit the chaos and confusion the multiplayer aspect brings to the game makes for a much more engaging play session. So what's up with the 4 player thing? Bomb Corp doesn't have any audience features, which is a bit of a bummer because this could have been a great stream game if viewers could vote on the wires that need to be cut. Even still, that 4 player cap sticks out like a sore thumb in a party game series all about playing games of large groups of people. I do get it personally since any more than 4 people would likely be way too hard to keep track of. I do bring it up though because this seems to be a red flag for a lot of other people. I've definitely seen people say, hey I already have plenty of other 4 player games I can play with my friends, so if I want to do something co-op, I'll play those. And I do get that stance. Honestly, whether or not you see this as a problem is going to depend on what you think a Jackbox game should be. While I personally don't think the Jackbox series should be restricted in this way, I do acknowledge that most people, when they pick up these games, they want a low-stress, casual party experience. And if what I just described is what you look for in a party pack game, then keep that in mind with this one. I think Bomb Corp is great. It's stressful, intense, and has has enough content, it really could be its own standalone game. But it's not for everyone. Something I do think everyone will appreciate, however, is the dialogue between the in-game staff. This is a really funny game with a fantastically dark setting. All of the characters have identifiable personalities, and everything progresses in a natural way. Props to whoever scripted all this. I generally don't find the hosts in Jackbox games to be all too funny. I mean, they're not terrible, but obviously the real humor is going to come from the players. In other party pack games, the scripted chatter you hear in-game ranges from chuckle-worthy at best and painful at worst. Not the case for Bob Corp, however. I found myself audibly laughing out loud at some of the stuff your coworkers say. All I'm saying is that if I take the last styrofoam cup, I open a new box, or I put in an order for more. People are so lazy. I don't enjoy working with you. <laughs> <laughs> the dark and often cynical style of humor contrasts super well with the dull office environment. Good work. It would have been a real bummer if everyone died on Megan's birthday. Like how Trevor died on my birthday. <sighs> Hats off to everyone who worked on this one. And that's Jackbox Party Pack 2. The second entry proves to be the hardest and the easiest Jackbox to recommend to other people. I say this because you have three controversial games, Earwax, Spidiots, and Bomb Corp, all of which having their low-key fans and detractors. Then the other two games are Fibbage and Quiplash, two more or less proven formulas that anyone will enjoy. It's hard to recommend Party Pack 2 because you may or may not like any of the three new games. Conversely, I recommend it for that very reason, because not only will at least one of those three likely click a few, if all else fails, you can still fall back on Fibbage or Quiplash, both of which you will almost certainly like. As a package, I'm giving Jackbox Party Pack 2 a 3.5 out of 5. Despite being a mixed handful of games, it's still an improvement on the original Party Pack. It's a safe bet you'll really like at least 3 of the 5 games it offer. I wouldn't say the risk is worth the game's value at 25 bucks, especially when Party Pack 3, the most unanimously esteemed Party Pack, can also be bought for that price. Regardless, I would go as far as to say it's worth something shy of 20. So when you see it on a moderate sale, get ready to defuse some bombs, lie to your friends, and bid on terrible doodles. Party Pack 2 might be the most diverse checkbox thus far, and it's worth your attention for that distinction alone. Hey, thanks for watching! This video ended up being way longer than I anticipated, so sorry this took so long. Life just sort of hit me like a brick wall. Anyways, I'd like to give thanks to patrons such as Abby Knutson, Ann Ross, Amanda Guth, Cashinator, David Pacheco, Jan Kopp, Jeffrey Long, John Hancock, Oliver Larkosh, Pretoria Mars, and Rami Batter. I'll try to get the next one out faster, but until next time, have a good one. I legit just bought this game just so I can have 10 seconds of footage in this video. I don't even like cards against humanity.